everyone. It's really lovely to see you all here in Chester um, and welcome to the Grove Museum. Um, I started work here just in this building about 10 years ago um, and uh, as curator of archaeology and at the time the archaeological collection was um, just as lovely as it is now but a little bit smaller. It's grown um, a lot over the past 10 years, um, mainly from one site, to be honest, just across the road underneath the Abode Hotel, where we had about 600 boxes of material. But um, now I don't just look after the archaeology collection, I look after all the other collections as well. Um, so it's really nice for me to be able to talk just about my my, uh, collect, my favourite collection. I shouldn't really say that, but um, I did. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so... I'm going to focus on the archaeology collections today, um, not just ones within the museum, because we have, um, it's probably not an unusual setup in local authority museums, but um, we used to have an archaeological unit, Chester Archaeology, um, based here in the museum. Um, as in common with lots of other local authority museums, the, that service has unfortunately been dwindling over um, the past few years. And um, although we do still have excellent archaeological offices, they're now within the museum services remit as well. So I'm not just talking about the historic collection from the um, museum, I'm talking about all of the collection that they've been curating too. Um, so I've called my talk Archaeology for the People, and I'm going to talk about some engagement projects, um, which we, or some of the diverse and exciting ways that we've brought archaeology to the people of Chester and beyond in recent years. Okay, so archaeology has been um, an important part of Chester for a very long time. We have one of the oldest archaeological societies in the country, which was founded in 1849, um, and they set up the or they helped to set up the Grover Museum in 1886. Um, those of you who um, came to on the tour this morning will have heard that it was built by public subscription so the people of Chester um, even at that time recognised the importance to have a repository for archaeological material um, where it could be cared for and displayed for people to enjoy and you can see here the notable worthies of the building committee, Grid Museum Building Committee standing on the steps um, of the museum when it, um, when it opened. Um, so, bar the uh, tricky post-war years of extensive redevelopment, archaeological discoveries here in Chester, on the whole, have been treated with care and enthusiasm and um, often excitement. As a museum um, service, our own efforts to engage the public with archaeology, um, the archaeology entrusted to us, have waxed and waned, and they're very much waxing again now. <laughs> the museum... Um, Gave it, when it was first built, gave citizens an opportunity to see what was being uncovered across the city. Um, and great efforts are made by the early curators to interpret the finds and give people lots of information. So here you can see um, our very first curator, Professor Robert Newstead. Um, he was a self-taught archaeologist, but um, a very fine one. And he regularly gave talks on his excavations and discoveries in this very room. But then... Um, he also took um, people around the site, in spite of the very obvious health and safety <laughs> nightmare that it looks. Um, this is actually the amphitheatre site, I should say. So he started um, digging trenches there in the 1930s when the curved wall was first discovered. Um, and he dug a series of trenches around the site um, and recovered remains from there. Um, so he took... Um, newspaper reporters and sub, uh, people who paid subscriptions um, and people who were campaigning to save the amphitheatre at that time um, around the site and told them all about what he was discovering. Um, and then after the war um, in Chester there were some notable and hard losses of archaeological remains um, most notably the legionary bathhouse on Bridge Street um, and very, not, not very much of that remains. And Mainly as a result of this, the walls went up quite literally in this case. So this is a, the same site, the amphitheatre site, in the 1950s. And you can see there, there's a great big fence around it with no holes at all. So no one can see what the archaeologists are doing on the inside. No one can get access to the site unless um, they're on the archaeological team. 
thankfully, for many years now, um, Chester has benefited from an excellent archaeological service and their involvement of the public with excavations, finds processing and displays has changed how many people in Chester view their city and its heritage. And though in common, um, as I said, with the other museum services, our team's much, much smaller now, the archaeological officers, um, Julie and Cheryl, who are both here, um, and uh, along with the museum's curatorial team and senior heritage officer, Jane, um, are continuing this excellent work. And here you can see, um, in the very latest phase of excavations at the amphitheatre in the 2000s, um, the members of that team. Um, you will notice, uh, while they're posed here, that their fencing there is completely see-through. And people were indeed encouraged to watch um, everyone at work while they were working on the site. Um, you can probably see in the background there against the fencing that people are peering through to have a look and lots of site tours were given as well. So this was a, um, a great site right in the centre of Chester where loads of people could see what was being excavated and what was coming out of the ground. Now back in the museum, um, I just want to touch on a couple of exhibitions now. Um, based on, on what Duncan and I did discuss uh, about thematic displays. So um, exhibitions are one of the most traditional ways we use to share our collections and information with visitors. Um, and I just want to highlight three. So this one um, was called In Good Humour, and it was all about diseases, doctors, and dying in the Roman world. Um, so it had lots of archaeology and, and lots and lots of loans from our own collections, uh, sorry, loans from national museums as well as um, items from our own collections. Um, it was a really engaging exhibition. There was lots of, um, I, was, I was going to say blood and guts, but they were actually that sort of thing in events that we had. Um, I don't know if you can see here. This is actually um, a bottom, <laughs> which uh, we did lots of Roman medicine, road shows and that sort of thing, and um, looked at fistulas and trepanning and that sort of thing. So this was a great exhibition to highlight um, the, a very interesting subject, but we did it in a really fun and engaging way. And we took this, um, that image there um, is actually from the Big Bang, um, which is a science event, uh, uh, which was at Birmingham that year. So we, we took the Roman Medicine Mojo out and we <clears throat> taught um, young people, young people who wanted to be scientists, all about Roman medicine. Um, another exhibition we've had recently is called Dead Normal, um, which looked at the death and how um, people had dealt with death in different ways over uh, in different time periods. So it featured um, items from every collection that we have in the museum, I'm pleased to say. There was lots of archaeology, um, some Egyptology, there was social history, costume, um, natural history and coins. So we had a little bit of everything. And that exhibition was um, received very well. It's slightly worrying putting an exhibition all about death um, and doom and gloom up, but um, people really enjoyed that exhibition. And again, we had lots of engaging events, including um, a life masks workshop where instead of making uh, death masks, we made life masks which were, um, was quite terrifying. It involved just putting two straws up your nose and having latex poured over your head, if anyone wants to try it in the future. Um, and you will have seen next door, um, if you had, had had a chance already, our latest exhibition is focusing almost solely on uh, archaeological treasure. So if you get a chance, um, do go and have a look at that. So moving outside the museum again, um, I want to talk about our training dig, which is run by the archaeological officers every year. Um, it started in 2007, actually as an extension of the amphitheatre environs excavation. So the idea was to have a look um, at the area around the outside of the amphitheatre to see what that could tell us. And after uh, that year, it was run as a community dig. A month, uh, there was a month-long community dig, um, which involved lots of people from Chester. The following years and every year since then, um, it's been run as a training dig for the University of Chester. So students have been learning archaeological excavation techniques um, and they also have a great opportunity to talk to local people and park users about what they're doing and what they're finding. So this is, this is the site here. Um, Julie did give me a run through before on exactly what um, I was looking at there and the site, but I don't, if, I'd suggest if you want to know lots about it, ask her at tea break. 
But basically, um, this site is in Grosvenor Park, which is a park right in the centre of Chester, um, adjoining the amphitheatre, um, very close to St John's Church, which you can see there in the background. Um, the, the dig uncovers uh, different aspects of the site every year, um, but what is actually underneath there is, uh, we think, the precinct wall of uh, the early St John's um, enclave and the houses that are in there, medieval houses, which have been converted into 16th and 17th century dwellings afterwards um, and then demolished as a demolition layer um, around the time of the Civil War. Um, there, <clears throat> this year, a, 16th, uh, sorry, a Saxon ditch was discovered, um, which you think might be the boundary ditch of Saxon activity going on in the amphitheatre. And there's also a lovely Roman road, which um, gets uncovered nearly every year, which goes from this area right into the um, entrance of the amphitheatre. So, um, Grosvenor Park is very busy and well used in the summer. And though the dig is fenced off um, for safety, park users are again encouraged to watch the team at work and to view the finds and ask any questions. And I'm not sure if you can see at the back here. Oh, where's that pointer? It's not working. At the back against the fencing, there's um, some budding young archaeologists who have come from a local nursery school and they were on their walk in the park and they've just stopped by to have a look. So it's widely encouraged that people <clears throat> come up and ask the archaeologists what's going on. Um, in recent years, we've had really great social media coverage, which um, our team have um, produced. Um, and the whole month, there's a general buzz of excitement um, around this area, culminating in an open day um, where the public can come and chat to students and archaeologists about the site and about what's been discovered. And here you can see um, some families who have been uh, visiting the park, just popping to see what's been happening. Um, and this is a very busy afternoon <clears throat> in the park. To maximise the public's access to the project this year, the team also ran some successful events um, such as find washing and set up an inf um, information point in the park pavilion, um, which was a lovely and much frequented building. And this ran from the end of the dig right the way through to and during the Festival of British Archaeology, um, and it was really well attended. Oh no, sorry, I don't have a picture there. <clears throat> but um, people were undertaking lots of finds washing and helping access the, um, the, dig, the finds that were found on the site there. Okay, so the next project I'm going to talk about is one called Chester Unlocked. This is quite an early project that I worked on um, when I first started here. So <clears throat> this project was designed to get the museum's archaeology collections to out to uh, more diverse audiences across the city. Um, it was a project that was funded by Chester Bid, CH1 Bid, which is the Business Improvement District. So they're an organisation who um, local shops and businesses will pay them a subscription, varying different amounts, and the Bid will organise events and activities and publicity to help, um, help them drum up business and football. So <clears throat> the project was facilitated by a local heritage engagement organisation called Big Heritage, and it saw um, a series of 30 mini museums being installed in retail outlets and empty spaces around Chester. You can see one here in um, Cork's Art, which is a wine merchant. So we did objects to do with wine and um, history of wine through time. Now the bid's aim was to drum up football in the city and um, for its members. <clears throat> and to do this, um, Hoot's Root was created. So this is Hoot. Um, a little character who appeared in lots of shops, um, inspired by Minerva's Owl um, and Minerva's Shrine, which is uh, just across the River Dee. And uh, Hoots appeared in each one of the shops that had one of our little museums in. And the idea was that families could go around, um, collect all the details of the Hoots they'd found, and then they'd get a prize when they handed it in. So it did make sure that visitors went into every shop that had them and then came to the museum to get their prize as well. And for older audiences um, or bigger families, there was the Diva Codex, which is a lot more about problem solving and um, information gathering, but a similar sort of trail. <clears throat> so here you can see um, a couple of the displays. They're very simple. Just um, Many of them are just Perspex boxes. Um, this is Jess from Cinderbox Coffee with some of our teapots. 
Um, and this is Chester Health Store, um, which had a display of drug pops um, outside their unit, actually. And um, you can see there was quite a lot of media coverage linked to this project, and we were assisted by some Romans and Vikings at some points. Um, but for us, it was a really fantastic opportunity to reach people who might not normally come into the museum. So people who were just popping out to the shops and might be going to one of the outdoor activity shops to buy some camping equipment would see some of our objects um, and everything was branded um, with the museum logos and people were encouraged to come back this way to the museum. And here you can see um, the geographical spread that we achieved around Chester. So we, we were, in, we were on, on all of the main streets in Chester. Um, it was really hard work and I, we, I, I had some initial concerns about security of the collections in these units, um, but to be honest, that all of them are retail units, they all have shutters, they all have alarm systems, they're all manned during the day, um, and one of them, in fact, where we displayed some hoards was um, a bank, Santander Bank, which is actually probably more secure than the museum. So um, we did do a site visit for each and every one of the um, areas we were going to display in and we rigorously checked all of the display cases to make sure they were secure. Um, but in the end, everything passed off very, um, very smoothly and all the partners were delighted how the city and visitors to it embraced um, our displays. And we were also very pleased to record an increase of 44% in our visitors here into the museum in the six months after Chester and Locked finished. Right, I'm going to talk about another project um, or another activity we carried out with Big Heritage, this local um, engagement organisation. Um, it's not one that I can pretend to know lots about, so I'm really I'm like a techno dunce, but um, it was a really successful heritage engagement project here in Chester, which combined augmented reality um, gaming and heritage and archaeology, and it saw very many people visiting our sites over a weekend in July 2017 and we've actually recorded sustained, um, a sustained legacy of heritage use um, after that time. can't say it's directly from it but um, definitely there's an upturn in how many people are using the sites. So for those of you not familiar with Pokemon Go, it's a free gaming app which you can download onto phones or tablets and once you set up your avatar character it uses your location to create a virtual map of the streets that you're on. Um, so here you can see Chester. And then you move around pokey stops, which are the little blue dots, um, collecting Pokemon that pop up as you're walking around. And you can battle these big red things with animals on top, our, um, or Pokemon on top, our gyms where you can battle other trainers for different Pokemon. So that's it in a nutshell. As I say, it's not, it's not a favorite game of mine. <laughs> But um, to coincide with Chester's Heritage Festival in 2017, the city was turned into a massive Pokemon Go fest, um, but with a really strong history and archaeology flavour. Um, so I obviously didn't have anything to do with the technology. That was left to Big Heritage, with whom um, we were working again, as I said, and Niantic, the company who launched Pokemon Go um, as an app. So our job um, here in the museum service was to provide the many people who came into the city with um, exciting opportunities to engage with our heritage. So our main concern, um, other than managing the volume of people we knew were going to come in uh, to the city, was that we didn't just want people wandering around the city, looking down at their phones, um, not looking at any of the beautiful buildings. We wanted them to look at the city and learn about it. So um, this map, another map, <laughs> trail was created um, you can see on it's going to work again. Yeah, on this side here, um, the blue dots <coughs> are pokey stops where people can go and get rare Pokemon, which is a which is a big thing in Pokemon Go world apparently. Um, so they had to visit ten sites around Chester, and they had to answer a question about that site based on the information that they saw there. Um, and if they got all 10 answers written on their sheet, they could come back and get a limited edition um, Pokemon certificate. Um, so that seemed to work well. We also, uh, there was also a passport, um, which was a very simple piece of card where they had to go around four big sites. So there was the um, Amphitheatre, the castle, the museum and Watergate Street in Chester. 
um, and they had to collect a stamp for each of those sites. But also at those sites, there were reenactors, history demonstrations, craft activities, finds tables, um, and curators at some point. <laughs> um, now, this uh, weekend was extremely popular, as I've said, and I didn't, uh, just to show you, can you see that? This is Bridge Street in Chester on the Saturday morning of the Pokemon Go Fest. I have heard reports that there were 17,000 people, extra people in Chester that weekend. So it was a slightly terrifying volume of people. Um, and as you can see, these people in Bridge Street are all staring down their phones, <coughs> trying to catch Pokemon. But um, the maps and the, pla and the trails and the passports did seem to work because our heritage um, sites were also extremely busy that weekend which was great for us. This is the castle. So this um, Chester Castle was open that weekend for the first time in 20 years. So lots of people wanted to go anyway, but it was incredibly busy. Um, so you can see this is the entrance to the castle um, on the far side. And there were reenactors um, who spoke to lots of people who probably, you know, I'm not saying they haven't engaged with Heritage before, but they were actually there to play a Pokemon game, but they got more than they bargained for. Um, and you can see here, at the bottom, I think, just this bit here. That's actually the queue um, of Pokemon players to get into the Agricola Tower, which is the oldest part of the castle. And there were no Pokemon up there either. So they did want to see the heritage. Um, and again, at the amphitheatre, we had activities going on there. Um, under the gazebos on the far side, that's me with my finds. Um, <clears throat> this is a Civil War chap in Watergate Street. Oh, he's, he's lost his Cavaliers wig because it was an incredibly hot weekend in July. Um, he's giving out stamps for the passports. And um, all over the city, there are just groups of people milling about playing um, Pokemon Go, but also, as you can see from this group in the Roman Gardens, looking at the interpretation panels. Um, so all in all, um, it was a big success. And there are regular community um, days now where people come into Chester still to play Pokemon, but also we put on extra events for them um, to tell them about the city still. Right. Um, on a much smaller and more relaxing scale, last summer we ran a project called Active Archaeology. Um, it was, uh, Jane and I worked on this project together and it was funded by the Roman Society. The idea behind it was actually to try and gather information about what people thought about archaeology um, in Chester, what they'd like to see, um, what they didn't like, um, to, for us to use in funding bids in the future. But we took it as an opportunity as well to explain to people what the archaeology, um, archaeological officers here in the museum do and why they do it and why it's important they keep doing it. Um, so, as part of this, we installed these really prominent posters in the Grosvenor shopping, uh, sorry, panels in the Grosvenor shopping centre. Um, there are actually four of them. This is just a picture of two. Um, so, you can, if you're walking through Chester later on through the Grosvenor shopping centre, you can go and have a look at these. But they detail some of the projects that the teams worked on um, and the finds that have been uncovered and um, explain to people what happens to them once they come here into the museum. They don't just get put in boxes, they're worked on and researched and looked after. Um, so as well as installing these panels, um, part of last summer saw, well at least, at least one day, Jane and I hopped onto a train um, along the Mid Cheshire Line and carried out um, a day called Archaeology on Trains. <laughs> so um, we, the Mid Cheshire Line runs from Chester to Manchester Piccadilly. It's a long, slow journey, um, very hot on that day as well. Um, but you do have a very captive audience. They, can't, they can hardly get away from you. Um, although luckily not many people did want to get away from us, um, I don't think. We talked to them, we, we showed them finds from, we showed people on the train finds from the amphitheatre and from the HQ site across the, um, across the way here. Um, and we talked to them about what, what they thought about archeology, span what they thought was interesting. Um, and I dare I say a lot of people did talk to us about D House which is a building in Chester, which is slightly controversial, so I'll not talk about it now. But um, it, there, was, there was definitely a lot of feeling and, and a lot of positive feeling on the train about archaeology in Chester. And we had um, a table with finds on the platform at Chester Station and one on Manchester Piccadilly Station. Um, and they were quite well frequented as well, although I think it's probably easier to catch people on the train rather than when they're running to catch one themselves. 
Um, but this has led to um, the station manager at Manchester Piccadilly station um, ask, uh, wanting to engage with us more in the future and possibly setting up more panels there to explain to people what they're going to see when they come into Chester. So as well as producing information for our future funding bids, it's actually drummed up more um, profile for us as well. Right, the last um, project I'm going to talk to you about, the HQ project. So across the road from here, um, there is a very big archaeological site. It's now got the Abode Hotel on top of it. Um, it used to be the police headquarters building from the 1960s. Um, and when it was knocked down, um, they thought because there were cells, um, police cells underneath um, this building, that there wouldn't be much archaeology under the ground. Um, but they were very wrong. Um, I, think the, I think the archaeologists were there for 18 months, 18 months um, excavating, and the material that they found was probably one of the best archives of archaeological material we have in the whole city. Um, so the site, there were Roman buildings there, quite high status ones with mosaic floors, um, lots and lots of um, Roman material. Then it was St Mary's Nunnery, so we have upwards of 200 skeletons from that site, um, along with lots of accompanying goods. Then it was um, Civil War era mansion, Burton House. Uh, then it was Victorian militia barracks, and then it was the police headquarters. So it's a really, uh, it's got a really exciting history. The site and the finds um, compare to that as well. They they really tell the story really well. Um, now because the archaeologists were on site for a lot longer than expected, um, when the excavations came to a finish, unfortunately the property developer had gone bust, um, and they didn't make any provision for post excavation work. Uh, so the entire archive of about 600 boxes was in storage with the archaeological con uh, unit for 10 years before it came to us. And meant much of it hadn't been cleaned, um, definitely hadn't been marked. It still, it still had quite a lot of the, the dirt from the site on it and some of it was just in sort of big plastic trugs um, and not even in boxes. So um, we really needed some help to sort this out. And uh, luckily, Historic England came to our rescue and gave us a grant to transform the archive into a secure and usable one. Um, now, as I say, we don't have as many archaeologists as we used to in the museum, um, so there was no way we could get through all this material on our own um, without significant help from the willing people of Chester. So, Julian Cheryl. Um, organised fine washing days with a dedicated band of volunteers who methodically went through the pottery, bone, building materials, metal small finds um, and uh, things from all different periods, cleaning, counting, weighing, reboxing, basically all of the work that you'd expect um, post-excavation but hadn't been carried out. And now the whole archive is safe for future research and potential display. And here you can see um, a happy band of volunteers working in the pavilion in Grosvenor Park. So um, Julie came up with the idea to make the finds washing and the project as visible as possible to other people in Chester. So it wasn't just these volunteers that were benefiting, it was people in the park who were passing who wanted to know about what was going on as well, that who were getting that information. Um, and what's really great is that many of these people have stayed with us even after that project's finished, so now that archive is away in store. The volunteers still coming in helping process no more finds that we have <coughs> um, in the museum. So, um, that's, that's, they are our latest engagement projects. Um, I think it's safe to say while our resources have shrunk, public interest and engagement with archaeology in Chester is definitely increasing. And hopefully by continuing um, both our core work and developing more innovative new projects, um, we might be able to talk to the SMA in future years about how we've been able to meet this steadfast demand for archaeology in our city.